are departing from James. And let me explain to you why. Last Sunday, I came to church, and we'll just call it the vibe. Morale was down. People were, were not rejoicing in, from just the weight of affairs. And as I spoke to some of um, the church members about it, they were sharing with me the things that they're like, look, man, um, you know, all this weight that we're all carrying is, is just breaking us down. And I thought to myself, well, James probably isn't going to help us with that because if there was a vibe to James, that vibe is, hey, get it together. <laughs> and that's not really a comforting and hopeful message. And so I'll kind of, in, until the Holy Spirit changes the track again, because I thought I was going to be going through James, um, to let you know that we're, we're changing tracks and to and the next for all of september i'm going to be preaching on how christians handle the world around them and i'm and today is sort of an introductory sermon into that but then we're going to get into how we live in hope and what we're supposed to live because christianity if you break it down i mean we have our christian duty the things that we are obligated to do. There's things like character, the people that we're called to be. But then there's also goals, and goals are different from duty, and that's what is it we're setting our minds to achieve and, and discerning. And that's to know what's a distraction and what do we really need to be pouring our efforts and our thoughts into. So also back to the slide business. So, oh, and then the good news is then in, no, um, through the two months before Advent, I'm actually going to be preaching through Revelation because it's a very timely book and because it's very confusing, most preachers just sort of ignore it. Like there is so much in here <laughs> that like, Ugh, I don't want to have to explain this, you know, but I'm going to take a stab at it. And the idea leading into the birth of Christ, just to kind of give it away, to wet your whistle, so to speak, the Jews were waiting for a Messiah, and the Messiah came, and we are waiting for the return of that Messiah to come in glory. And we don't need to be afraid of all the fantastic imagery, because the battle belongs to the Lord, and that is our hope. Just as the Jews were waiting for a Messiah, we are a people awaiting our Messiah's return to make things right. And just as the Messiah was promised, and they had to wait, hundreds of years they had to wait. We have been waiting for 2,000 years and we'll keep waiting. But one day, he will return. So, that's sort of the next three months or four months, as it were, just to kind of let you know there is a plan. But like I said also, I thought I was going to be preaching through James, and the Holy Spirit overrode that. So we'll see how it goes, right? <laughs> Another reason why this is a generic slide is because today is a topical sermon, and when I preach topically, I get very nervous. And the reason I get very nervous is because anytime somebody pulls a Bible verse out, to prove their point, immediately kind of like eye that suspiciously. Because it is extremely easy for a man to say, I am looking for a sentence in the Bible that's going to prove my point. And they can twist that scripture around and they can make the Bible say whatever they want it to say. And so to safeguard against this, we take scripture in large swaths. And so there's going to be a lot of scripture today. And I thought it would be better for me to encourage you that if you want to follow along, if you're somebody who reads as the pastor is reading and you want to like confirm like, hey, is he really saying what it says? There are pew Bibles in front of you 
and go ahead and mark them open. We're going to be in Luke chapter 22, or 21, excuse me, and we're going to be in John chapter 15. And so those are, you know, Luke 21, John 15. Um, go ahead and, and, you know, pull out those pew Bibles, and if you want to follow along, that's where we're going to be. So I've explained how I'm departing from the norm because we're moving on from James, and, and like I said, here's the reason. There is a weight on us. I am a preacher and I am a man, and as a man, I feel that weight. When I go to the grocery store, I feel that weight. When I walk to work, I feel the weight. There is a very real weight weight that is on humanity right now. And to be honest with you, I first started feeling it about two, three years ago. And it's real. And if you're feeling it, you're not alone. It's a heavy time to be alive. And we need to address it. As we're all weighed down with the state of the world, we need a message of hope. And if we're a people who are demoralized. What has beaten us down? As Christians, if we are a people who are demoralized, what has done that to us? Because nowhere in Scripture are we called to be a people who are demoralized. So if we're demoralized, something snuck in. There is something going on. So let's talk about just, I'm going to, you know, it's kind of like one of those things where I, I, things that I said I would never say behind the pulpit, and once again, the Holy Spirit overrides all my best thoughts. Thank God. Praise be to the Lord forever. Let's talk about it. We got COVID as the disease. At this point, everyone knows someone who has been taken by COVID. We pray for people who are in the hospital, I have very dear friends who are in the straits. COVID is a disease, and everyone right now is in some form of mourning over this thing that is real. We are in a genuine pandemic. It's not made up. There is a disease called COVID that has severely disrupted our normal way of life. We have the COVID countermeasures that stress us out. No matter what side of the political aisle you're on, whether you're on on the one side saying, we need masks, we need vaccines, we need to to separate, we need the world to shut down for a, a couple years if that's what it takes. And I am stressed out that you have these other people over here who are getting together and whatever it is they're doing, and if they just followed the rules, this thing would be over. And we got the people over here who are saying, this is an infringement on my liberties. I am upset and I am offended. Every time I go out and I see people in masks, it bothers me. So no matter what side of the aisle you're on, you're stressed out at the COVID countermeasures. Bummer. I can't even tell you there's a side you can be on that's not going to stress you out. We have uh, the situation in Afghanistan that super duper stressful that we don't understand the ramifications of this in the long term as far as like socio-political stuff. As a church member and as a Christian, I mourn and I grieve as the reports that the Taliban has already started slaughtering the church in Afghanistan, which was one of the fastest growing churches through Iranian missionaries. Stressing me out. It's a, it's a tragedy. There's civil unrest, burnout. I mean, uh, you know, the country has really been in civil rest, upheaval, as we have had to wrestle and grapple with civil rights issues. And in a lot of ways, I have civil rights burnout where it's like there was another protest, there was another riot, and I'm like, oh, another one. 
I don't even care what their message is anymore. Civil rights burnout. We have concern for our church. We have fear of government overreach, loss of liberty, living in a nation that's declining economically, ethically, and influentially on the world scene. Need I go on? This is a stressful time. There is a lot to, and I'm saying all these things not for you to like go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Ugh. That's not my point. My point is I'm acknowledging to you it's real. If you are feeling that weight, you're not crazy. As something that amazes me is every time I talk to people who have lived with demonic influences in their home and they say, and I'm like, why didn't you ever tell anyone? And they're like, I just thought people would think I was crazy. What you're dealing with is real. These are real things that impact us. And as I sat down to write a message of hope, I had something strange happen as I ran through all these things in my mind. It was very strange because I, I really wanted to come today with this flowery message to hand to you that was very um, uplifting and, and, you know, don't worry, Jesus has got you. And there was a verse that since this was the first one that started running through my mind as I sat down to write this sermon, enough that it impacted me. And this is a message from Jeremiah where God is addressing the false prophets of the day. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. And this is what ran through my mind. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace. Peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush, so they will fall among the fallen, and they will be brought down when I punish them. Thus says the Lord. Brutal. I'm not even going to read you what became before and after that, because it's brutal. Have we forgotten that the Lord is the Lord of nations? Have we forgotten that the Lord is sovereign? Have we forgotten that the Lord will rise up nations to punish other nations who have lost their way? Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I can tell you, I fear the Lord, not because I fear him the way that a dog fears a man who abused him. I fear him in what he is capable of. I fear him because on judgment day, not everyone will be treated just the same. Hebrew says it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Why do we say peace when there is no peace? And when there is no peace in the world... And I'm going to just lay it on you. I was reading in Ecclesiastes, and he says, don't revere the past. Don't look at the past through the lens of nostalgia. It's not wise. And I agree with that because God is sovereign. And all history is God's history with his people. So let me explain. There are three different eras in the Old Testament that end with the end of Genesis. And it begins in Egypt. And then when God's people are enslaved for hundreds of years, God says, I used this time and I used the oppression of the Egyptians to turn you into a strong, capable nation. You came in a family and you left as a nation. I used this oppression to forge you into the people that I wanted you to be. Well, that's of no comfort to the people who were living in it. So then, 
God liberates them through signs and miracles that we talk about to this day. As it says in the word of the Lord, no one will ever forget that I have done this, says the Lord. To this day, we remember what the Lord did and what the Lord has done. God creates a people and he brings them into the land that he promised Abraham hundreds of years. Another promise fulfilled by the Lord that took hundreds of years to fulfill. And we enter into what we call the era of the judges. The theme of that book is at that time there was no king in Israel and everyone did as they saw fit. It's my favorite biblical era that if I got to choose one to live in, I would live in the era of the judges because I'm like, hey, you know, like anarchy in, in the UK, you know, all right. Um, I'm kind of a rebel. But in this era, there's a cycle, and it's story after story after story after story after story. And if you don't believe me, go home and read the book of Judges. It's a short read. God's people enter into a time of prosperity. God's people forget the Lord and turn to wickedness. The Lord brings up a people to punish the Jews. They cry out and they ask for help and God raises up a deliverer among them who then releases them from the oppression. They return to the Lord. They go into good times and they forget the Lord. And it's just this cycle. And it went on for about 800 years. Think about that, 800 years. It's a long span of history. The Lord is merciful and he is slow to anger. So then they say, we want a king, all right? All these other nations, they got kings. We want a king. God says, no, a king's a bad idea. You don't really want a king. And they're like, oh, yes, we do. Samuel says, who's the prophet at the time, he goes, no, 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 no. Trust me, this is a bad idea. And God says to Samuel, don't worry, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Because what they're not saying, they're not saying, I want a king, they're saying, I don't want God to be my king. And we enter into a very short era of Israelite history. We call it the United Kingdom. And it lasts three kings. Saul starts out real good, and then he goes a little nuts. And you tend to forget, like, as we look at it, we're like, King Saul, he's doing great until he slaughters priests that harbored David because he was after David. And now the country is already like first king right out of the gate. <laughs> Civil war. And when we read this, we forget when we read things. It's like these people were slaughtered. And we read it and we're like, bummer. Yeah, well, you know, for those people... That was a stressful time. For David, hiding in a cave with his band of like rebels, as it were, knowing that the king and his armies are hunting you down. Ooh, stressful times. If we read Psalms, it deals with that. Then there's what we call the era of the divided kingdom. And this is when God says, all right, Solomon... You messed it up. I'm ripping the kingdom away from your dynasty. Now you have Israel to the north, and you have Judah to the south, and there's a border, and now they're enemies. The north sets up two altars to like a state god. You know, it's not to the god of Israel. And that's why if you read Chronicles and Kings, it says no sin was greater in Israel than was the sin of Jeroboam, because he was the guy who set him up, and Israel was never since that moment, able to fully turn and commit to the Lord. So now we have this long list of good king, bad king in the south, but bad king, bad king in the north. 800 years, about, I'm rounding. They endured this until God said, I have had enough. I have had enough of this. 
and I'm going to raise up a people. And these people were called the Assyrians. And what the Assyrians were known for was brutal torture. People like to think Vlad the Impaler was the guy who started sticking people on spikes. It wasn't. It was the Assyrians. I'm not going to get into gory detail, but they were known in the world as being a merciless, torturous, and bloodthirsty people. And he, God says, I am going to raise up this people that will shock you. And I'm going to use them to punish you and rip you out of the land that I promised you because you're not doing what I told you to do. In the last 1,600 years, all you have done is rebel. And they say, what about the Assyrians, God? You're supposed to be just and holy. He's like, oh, I'm cooking up a plan for them. That plan was called the Babylonians. They rose up, conquered the Assyrians. Judah turns away from the Lord. He says, I gave you a last shot. You're out. Babylonians, take them. And the temple is destroyed. And the Jews are now a people in exile, and no one is left in the land that God had promised to worship the Lord. The temple destroyed. And they're weeping, and they're wailing, and they're saying, God, have you forgotten us? And he says, hey, I got a plan for the Babylonians. It's called the Persians. They raise up, conquer the Babylonians, and a remnant gets to return. And then we have the intertestimonial period. I'm going to run through this. You got the Greeks who unite the world in language. You have the Romans who the Pax Romana create roadways and, and it's easy to travel. All this is setting up so that when Jesus comes, the gospel is ready to be spread out into the known world quickly and efficiently because there's a common language and safe roads. The reason I'm saying all this is the world has always been a Bitter, violent, turbulent, wasteland of human misery. Okay? Let's just call a spade a spade. There has never been a time in human history when it's been all good. Ever. All right, so let's talk about us as people, right? Because we're all alive. We all remember the past, right? And let's just go back to, I was talking to one of our, our more venerated church members and so we're just going to go back 100 years. And no one in this room or who is listening remembers fully the last 100 years. But we're going back to like 1921, right? World War I, the Great War that everyone thought was her heralding the second coming of Christ because the world had never known such violent and bitter warfare. It's been over for three years, leading to the roaring 20s. Economic growth, modernization of telephones, automobiles, electricity... I mean, remember, the 20s is like when, when Edison and Tesla are facing off. I mean, I, I remember I was watching a show once where there was an old man, and he was at a world fair, and he, like, turns on a lamp, and everybody just, like, walks by, and he goes, this doesn't amaze you? I nearly knocked my socks off when I saw this at the world's fair in 1930. It, electricity in my generation can't fathom living without it. Caleb's generation can't fathom living without the internet. They grew up with it. Streaming. People have forgotten what it was like as a family to have to have a TV guide to know what time your shows were coming on. And when you and your friends were out playing ball, you're like, I gotta go. Star Trek is on in 15 minutes. And then you went and got snacks and went to the bathroom during commercial breaks. Dude, the new generations, this is a foreign concept to them. But back to, the, back to history, this little impromptu. Then we get into the 30s, right? The Great Depression. My mother-in-law has a phrase that she says, and it, she says, as long as we got a potato for the baby, we'll be all right. She learned that from her mother, who raised him during the Great Depression. As long as I have a potato for the baby, we'll be okay. Times were tough. And from that point on, we got the 40s. What does everyone remember about the 40s? World War II, spring, 1942. World War II happens. They thought World War I was bad. Bam, we got World War II. There's a book written called Man's Search for Meaning, written by a Holocaust survivor. I recommend you all read it. Times were tough. Times were brutal. And we as Americans were insulated because our factories didn't get bombed out. Our cities didn't get bombed out. There's a reason why the European church has been in 
steep decline since World War II because they looked at the brutality around them and said, how can God exist? The end of the war, we're the only people who have factories. We've got the atom bomb and we're the only ones who got it. And the 50s is an age of, 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 of American prosperity. Well, for most of us, the civil rights movement wasn't until the 60s. I was watching a preacher and he said, you know, like as we navigate this civil unrest that we have in this country, there's a lot of differences when we look in the rearview mirror. The fight of whether or not we can pray in school doesn't matter if your kids aren't allowed in school. He's talking about segregation, integration. Now we're starting to get into history that a lot of you can start remembering. I wasn't there. Times were tough. The 60s, civil rights movement. But 1969, we land on the moon. The 70s, we had a gas shortage. And, and a lot of good rock and roll <laughs> came out of that. 80s, the birth of the digital age. And then the 90s, the double lots, the tens, where we've been in endless conflict in countries that we um, were just in. Let's look back at the last 5,000 years. The world's always been a tough place. There has always been wars, rumors of wars. I'm not even going to get into all the various pestilences and famines and droughts that the world has had to endure. I am not telling you this to frighten you. I'm just saying let's have a wake-up check here. The world's always been awful. And that's just the way it is, right? I mean, who can, this is history. Who can dispute this? It's fact. You can read it in history books. It's not to say that nothing good ever happened. You know? But now we start getting into the scripture. Let's get into the hope a little bit. I'm going to read to you out of Luke chapter 21. And we're going to go through a lot of it because like I said, I'm not going to pull out a verse to make my point. We're going to get a full thought here. Some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. And Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another and every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? And he replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first. But... The end will not come right away. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you to synagogues, put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind beforehand how you will defend yourselves. Or make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words of wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will all be betrayed, even by parents, brothers, sisters, relatives, friends. They will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm, and you will win life. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. 
Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees when they sprout You see for yourselves and you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation certainly will not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful. And this is kind of the moral of the story here. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, Drunkenness, and this is the one that I circled in my color book Bible. The anxieties of life. He warns us 2,000 years ago, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with the anxieties of life. And he's talking about the second coming on that day, and he says, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth, Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Brutal. Brutal. And this is what we call the blob of prophecy. And the reason why we call it that is because if you look at a mountain range, you you just see this, but you can't tell how far apart those are. Because Jesus is talking about the tension of the already and the not yet. He's explaining that the temple that you are all so in love with, it's so beautiful, it's going to get ransacked. And I actually read in Josephus, the antiquities of the Jews, I read his account of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and it's just like Jesus said it would be. It was brutal. But... We have something that happened, and we have the the second coming. And the end will not come right away, but it'll spring like a trap. And it's easy to grow complacent because, honestly, I'm not waiting for Jesus to return. I mean, I know he will, but I'm not banking on it. I I don't sit at home twiddling my thumbs saying, you know what, things are so bad, Jesus is going to come back. And when he does, he's going to fix all this right, so I'm just going to sit and wait. No, man, it's not like that. But I also had a sign in my office for years that said, maybe today, and it was to remind me it will spring like a trap and it could happen. (laughs) Just like in Genesis, during the flood, people were going about life. People had plans when the rain started falling. Judgment is coming. Make up your mind not to worry. And this is what I, like, oh, man, this is such a hard sermon. Make up your mind not to worry, brothers and sisters. Don't worry. Because if we stand firm, we will receive a reward that we can't begin to fathom. The gift of life eternal with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. That, like Don said, Jesus is like, welcome home. Welcome home. Let's go meet the Father. And I will be with my people who are perfected. That we will have bodies that don't ache, that don't get sick. 
we will be able to be with our ancestors who are so thrilled to see us and we'll be thrilled to see them. I, with all of eternity, I'll have time to, cha- to chase down my train of witnesses all the way back to Jesus where it's like, well, who brought you to the Lord? Well, my dad. Well, who brought your dad to the Lord? This guy. And I'm like, hey, that guy, who brought you to the Lord? And it'll all go back and we'll have time to worship and praise and there will be no more sorrow and there will be no grief. So do not worry because the Lord will set these things right. Make up your mind now not to worry. Easier said than done, I might add. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with the anxieties of life, but Jesus will come back and he will set it right, but it will be a very frightening and terrible time. It won't be easy. We're not a people without hope because we have the hope that Christ will return. Amen? Do we live in that hope? Do we believe in our heart that this world is an illusion of the things that are to come? This world is not our home. This government is not my government. I belong to the kingdom of God. I'm an ambassador in this land. And if I live, I live. And if I die, I die. But my life belongs to the king. And I will get to go home. We're not a people without hope. And now we're also people who with work to do. And I'm going to read John 15. Jesus says, I am the vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Ouch. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Ouch. (laughs) But so that it may be even more fruitful. You are already clean because the word that I have spoken to you remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you now. My people, I added that, my people, that that wasn't Jesus, I added it in there. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has known than this, that he lay down life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you my friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. If the world hates you. Now there's a break in our Bibles, but it shouldn't be there. This is a singular thought. Think about it. The juxtaposition of love and hate. He says, this is my command, that you love each other. If the world hates you, this is the opposite of love. You keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than the master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they obeyed my teaching, 
They will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin as it is they have seen, and they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. We have work to do. We are the vine, Christ is the branches, and this is our work. This is our work to love one another. Are we doing it? Are we allowing our anxieties, are we allowing our fears to weigh us down, to keep us from loving each other with full, real, loving hearts? We can't do it on our own. We cannot muster this up inside of us. We must remain in the vine that is Christ Jesus. He needs to be our singular thought. Not Facebook. Not Twitter. Not CNN. Not Fox. Jesus Christ our Lord. Who gave us the words of hope. Who gave us love. Who gave us mercy. Who gave us joy. And joy is not happiness. Don't confuse those. We as Americans have forgotten how to grieve. We have forgotten how to feel and not say, oh, this is uncomfortable. I have to do everything to make it stop. Sometimes we have to grieve, and that means resting in the uncomfortable and allowing ourselves to feel the full range of human emotion. Joy is not happiness, and happiness is not joy. But we remain in Christ. If we abide, His nourishment will create fruit in us. Our primary function is to put our roots into Jesus. And through that, this will give us character. And this character will manifest itself in loving one another. No more judgment. No more sneers, no more jabs, no more backbiting, no more ignoring each other. If we're going to survive, we got to start loving each other. And that's not just the cessation of hostilities, but the presence of fellowship. COVID blew our church apart as far as programs and functions go. We're trying to bring it back. It's going to take time. In the meantime, are you having dinner with one another? Are you playing cribbage with one another? Are you playing bridge with one another? Are we getting together like family? Are we having love feasts? And we're like, well, the church doesn't have potlucks. And we're like, okay, let's, have, let's come to each other's homes. Are we doing that? Are we fellowshipping? Are we loving one another? Because let me tell you this. If we're going to reach the world, if we're going to reach Wilhelmina, it's got to start here. It's got to start here. I'm going, it's it's the end of my time. But let me tell you this, that I promise you that your church leadership, the elders, we're working, we're working on things. We really are, I promise. In the meantime, don't forget what Jesus said. The world is a brutal and awful place and it's going to smash you. Don't be alarmed. Don't let this anxiety weigh you down. Abide in Christ, and through that you will be nourished, and through that nourishment you will produce fruit, and the first big fruit is love. That's the message. Isn't it? We have hope. This world is, like I say, it's, a, it's not an illusion in that it doesn't really exist. I believe that this pulpit is here. I believe I'm touching it. It's, it's not like an illusion like the ghosts of um, Haunted Mansion at Disney World. You know? Like, that's an illusion. It's not real. You heard me up there. But when I say that this world is an illusion, what I mean is all the things that distract us are n- distractions. The only thing that we need to worry about is abiding in Jesus Christ. Loving God, loving others, and making disciples.
Do not be surprised when the world hates you because it hates God. Well, we love God, so the world hates us. Don't be surprised, but carry on. So on the day of judgment that is coming, that will spring on us like a trap, whether we, we die naturally, unnaturally, whether Christ comes back while I'm alive, you know, like, I hope it's when I'm office preparing a sermon. That would be a nice place for me to be when Jesus comes back, not like doing something else. Um, I want to stand before the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. And then I get to go home. I get to go home. There is hope. And I'd like to read this to you. This is from um, Voice of the Martyrs, which if I had my way, you would all subscribe to this. It's excellent perspective. It's global perspective. And uh, after I had written my sermon, so none of this is in my notes, I read, I read the beginning. It's, it's from the, the president of the organization, and he says this. When the Apostle Paul addressed the Athenians, he seemingly had a temple to every god or every goddess imaginable, and he declared, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. And for many years, I viewed these Athenians as being entirely different from the majority of people today, whom I considered to be irreligiously secular, earthly, worldly, to use scriptural terms. I've come to realize, however, that most people today practice a sort of religion associated with their secular beliefs. Their desires are firmly fixed on the fallen world. And they are religiously devoted to consuming information about it from a perspective that excludes any notion of God's power, his plans, or his purposes. The variety of news media have such an influence on us that the consumption and debate of information about the temporal world that we just learned is doomed to destruction have become a powerful religion. The secular system of belief and practice implicitly disavows and even blasphemies the eternal. God is always sovereign everywhere over everything and everyone. He is God Almighty, the King of glory, the King of kings, and we fail to glorify Him as we should when we behave as if sinful governments or people in this world are ultimately in charge. The stories in this month's magazine are perfect examples of the truth. The news or temporal perspective of events regarding Somalia in the last 80 years could hardly be worse. But throughout those decades, God has been working out his eternal plans and purposes quietly but inexorably through the lives of his faithful servants. The story about Somalia, the Somali people, God's great story will echo through all of eternity while the news will mean nothing by comparison. There is an eternally significant God glorifying way to look at the world. Will we honor God and lift up our eyes? And now I echo what this man says. If we are not careful, we will allow the things of this world to dominate our lives via mass media and our devices that support it. Many of us are so devoted to information about the temporal world that we offer it our first waking thought. Each morning, we spend hours absorbing and discussing it with others throughout the day, and we even allow it the final word as we drift off to sleep. I am not immune. I have had to hold myself accountable and repent on many occasions by closing my day in prayer. Heavenly Father, please forgive me for my prayerlessness and my failure to properly meditate upon your word and consider your eternal purposes today. Would that I sought you instead of being immersed in the things of this world from my first thought of the day until now. And he says, I pray through this month's magazine you'll experience a powerful episode in God's great story. Give him all the glory and share it with others. This is my conclusion, brothers and sisters, to wrap it all up because I'm, I'm w well over my time. But it's, I think it's a pertinent message. This, is, this has been the point that I've been driving home. Do not look at the past with nostalgia and say this is an entirely new thing that we're going through as a people. Humanity, I hate to say it, but it's a fact. Humanity has always had to suffer. We live 
in a sinful, broken, fallen world since we were exiled from the garden. There has been murder, there have been wars, there has been brutality. Do not be surprised that this is coming upon us. But don't focus on it. Don't allow it to creep into your hearts. Don't allow it to creep into your minds. Focus on Jesus. Remain in the vine. Remain in God. Remain in Him. Because if these people who are being drugged out of their homes and beaten to death can say, it is with joy and gladness that I meet the Lord every day, we are capable of that same faith. Let us not get distracted by the world. Let us not get distracted by the temporal that is doomed for destruction. Let us remember, brothers and sisters, we are a people who worship the living God, who is sovereign over everything, and He will set all things right. And that is my message of hope that I have sought to deliver. And like I said in the beginning, I wanted to write this super flowery, like, hey guys, it's all, you know, like, be super stoked. But it, why do you say peace to my people when there is no peace? And why do you superficially dress the wounds of my people? Guys, it's tough out there. It's tough. I feel it. But let's remain in Jesus. Maybe it's time instead of reading the news to read this. Maybe instead of reading our Facebook pages, we need to be reading this. Maybe instead of spending time talking about the political woes of our nation, we should be talking about how are we going to disciple our community? How are we going to disciple ourselves? I'm going to end with an, with an altar call. And it's not to say, if you have yet to receive Jesus as your Savior, please come forward and receive him. It's going to be a time for us to repent. If we have allowed ourselves to get distracted, to get pulled off mission, to get bogged down in the anxieties of this life, we're going to have a time to come forward and say, forgive me, Jesus. Put me on mission, and I'm going to start us out. I'm going to start us out, and then I also have a little video to play. And if you don't want to come forward, I urge you, sing along with the song that we have chosen to play. Sing along, sing it. Don't read it, sing it. Lift up your voice, because it's, it's real. So I'm going to start us out. And I want you to know that this is not a prayer of show. I am genuinely praying before God. And if you feel convicted, please come forward. Jesus, forgive me that I have allowed my ego to distract me, that I have allowed the anxieties of this life to push me into a place of ineffectiveness. Forgive me, Lord, that I, I don't do it enough. Whatever it is, I lay my heart before you, Jesus, and I lay my life before you. If you want to take me, then take me. But do not let me be idle. Do not let me get distracted. There is nothing in this world for me. Only you. May I follow you with my whole heart. Forgive me in the places that I have sinned and re renew a right spirit and a clean heart in me that I would be made pure so that when I speak you the word to those who don't know you, they would come to know you so that we could be together forever. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive your people. May we remain in you and do the things that you have called us to do. In the morning.